saw his older son, and he said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your equipment, your quiver and bow, and go out to the open country and hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Okay, now, before we leap forward to the next test, um, it seems that Rebecca, Isaac's wife, also had a favorite between her two boys, Esau and Jacob. Is this theme uh, starting to sound a little bit ridiculous? Esau was rough and tumble, he was a rough and tumble outdoorsy type. And Jacob was more indoorsy and studious, more of a mama's boy. He spent more time with his mom. Esau was the firstborn of the two, however, and because of this, he was in line for his father's heritage and blessing. All right, you ready for parts two and three of today's text? This comes from Genesis 27, verses 15 through 23. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goatskins. Then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she had made. He went to his father and said, my father. Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you have told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. <laughs> then Isaac said to Jacob, <laughs> Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. And he sounded just like that, by the way. <laughs> Jacob went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, This is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So, and we'll just chalk this up to very old age, so he proceeded to bless him. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar, and he poured oil on top of it. He called this place Bethel. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that God gives me, I will give God a tenth. So catch that, a tenth. This is where we get our idea of tithing, by the way. Uh, but we'll talk about that another time. All right, for now, the pulpit is all, all yours, Pastor Colleen. Okay. So, I mean, the scripture's length was as long as my sermons tend to be, but it's pretty important to navigate through this journey. 
If you spend any time with the Abraham clan, you will never fail to be entertained. Like a TV novella, this family reads. Today we hear of Jacob, who was quite frankly, well, pretty disreputable, and he was manipulative. He's not a truth teller now, is he? Which makes stage two fo faith folks that we talked about last week squirm in their seats because the if then justice and morality scope breaks down. But as today's commentator writes, the policy and polity of being chosen can seem to be a bit arbitrary throughout scripture. The existence of a favored child, though, is nothing new to us. It's painfully familiar in people's families. And moreover, privilege can actually function as a kind of chosenness when it relates to matters of gender and race and class and sexual identity. Now, some of you may remember our study a few years ago when I actually trekked through the whole Abraham and company story. Great lessons can be learned by other people's gaffes. Therefore, there are many living lessons in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their legacy of dishonesty and deceit, all to ensure that they get what they want, if that's not just saving their own hide. We do indeed teach our children both the good and the bad and the ugly of our mortal pilgrimage, don't we? How we respond to life circumstances by leaning on our own siloed deductions, that is, leaning not on God's but our own understanding, ensures us to repeat these cycles of sadness and deceit over and over, often then being mimicked by those under our care and influence. Yes, our black and white understanding of the creator and creature is passed down from generation to generations to follow. And it's easy to see how easily the God of man gets twisted when we create God and God's desires in our own image, with our own preferences and practices, and most definitely being at the right place. So back to Jacob at the close of today's text. He's been on the run, and he has just been given familial blessing guaranteed. Yet as he awakes, he seems to metaphorically scratch his head and say, why me? Stage two thinking of this kind of situation would have doomed him for all of his conniving ways, yet he is blessed. Navigating this mystery, he attributes his heavenly confirmation to the place in which it happened. The Celtics call this thin space. Jacob calls it Bethel, meaning house of El or house of God. At Bethel, Jacob builds an altar with a commitment that if God chooses to continue to bless him, then he will return a portion of his blessedness back to God. Notice how that commitment had a condition. If I am blessed, God, then I will return a tenth to you. You can hear the remnants of stage two ringing, conditional gift giving. But in time, and by the time of Moses, this humble beginnings of altars and gifts is expanded. The foundation of religious orthodoxy has been laid through the works and worship of the chosen people, not just a chosen person. And that, my friends, brings us to stage three faith development. Stage three synthetic conventional faith is what Fowler calls it, which generally starts about the age of 13 and goes until around 18 years old. However, there are many, 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 many people who spend their entire adult life stuck here. This stage aligns with Piaget's stage of formal operational thinking, and his begins about 12 years old, just a little bit off of that Fowler timeline. And unlike previous stages, people at this stage can think abstractly. This evolution of thinking makes it possible for adolescents or adults to hold an understanding of the divine in like a formless manifestation. And they're developing the sensibility to others as well that, that maybe 
those people over there might not think just like me. And then like-minded groups start forming. And what seems to be unrelated stories and rituals can now be seen as a more cohesive narrative about values and morals for any given group. With the growth of abstract thinking comes the ability to see the layers of meaning in their collective faith stories and rituals and symbols like wrestling with an angel, climbing up a stairway to heaven, or altars made of stone. We see people at this stage, mostly adolescents and young adults, begin to claim faith as their own, though about 90% of the time they choose the faith tradition of their families of origin or whoever raised them. In organized religion, shifting one's commitment to faith tradition or practice encourages personal responsibilities to the system or the chosen leader of choice. We hear phrases like having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Enrolling and encouraging young ones to enroll in Sunday school or catechism or Hebrew school and other forms of some people would say indoctrination or tutelage. Next, once everything they need to know is set in place because you always learn everything you need to know by the age of 14, <laughs> you get to graduate. <clears throat> These disciples taking part in significant rites of passages marking their accomplishment and understanding. Let me give you some examples of that tribal tattoos, first communion, pilgrimages, mikvah, that Hebrew ritual of cleansing that Jesus partook of in the River Jordan, bat or bar mitzvah, evangelical tours, confirmation, believers baptism. Baptism is what one probably most familiar with folks here. For many in the Reformed traditions, from Anabaptist to Baptist to the disciples of Christ, baptism can be a two or three for one event. <clears throat> we are so good with our time. <clears throat> in these traditions, the preferred mode of baptism is immersion. Following in that Judea, Judean, Judean and Jude Jewish uh, religious practice of mikvah, the whole person from tip top of their head down to their little tippy toes goes under the water. One point and purpose of baptism is one's pu public proclamation of believing in the lordship of Christ in their lives. Now, depending on the tradition, lordship takes on different meanings. For some, it's accepting the teachings of Jesus and committing to a new direction. We call this conversion. Others yet are proclaiming the lordship and the divinity of Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, often paired with the hope for eternal life, that salvation, living with God, their Lord and Savior, from here to eternity and through. In this latter grouping, you also will find the Trinitarians. Jesus the Christ is God incarnate, <clears throat> as is the Holy Spirit. It's a three, three, three for one God. All of the above are steeped symbolically in water. The second gift of baptism for many in this belief in this belief is the salvific properties of the baptismal waters itself. You got that? So it's the saving feature of this holy water itself. Literally washing away your sins when you're baptized. A belief that often crosses baptismal form from immersion to sprinkling an infant's head during infant baptism. The third use of baptism is church membership, sometimes just into the local church or sometimes like the disciples into the universal disciples, global church. Many of the churches that require believers baptism, not all, not us, say that the only way to membership is to be baptized or immersed, immersed essential. Though the disciples of Christ choose immersion as their preferred form of baptism, we do honor all other forms of this rite and this practice in other traditions. Whew, a long text and then all that. You're probably are going, why did you chase that rabbit? And it's to give you an example of how convoluted orthodoxy and systems of belief can be, even in, in 
Christian churches that seem so much alike. What one faith tradition believes about baptism versus another has created more splintered groups in organized religion than any of us can count. And that's just one facet of a system and its orthodoxy. The byproducts of stage three systems of faith overfloweth. Have you noticed how many churches and temples and mosques there are to ha house such diversity of faith traditions? Just drive around. Unfortunately, most of our parking lots are empty, but they're all out there. From Bethel to Babel to Notre Dame, think about it. What in our Judeo-Christian tradition began as just a few stones piled up in the promise of a 10% return has become mankind's creation of not only altars and steeples, but the systems that metaphorically hold them all together. Those moving from stage two to three begin to seek and see the value of security through others. Nudges of the if-then logic advances to, if I find the right altar, the right place, and maybe I will find good favor with the creator. And favor with the creator that brings security as part of, of creation and all of its infinity. Where'd that idea come from? The arc of the narrative is shifting. Up until this point, and thought, there are still some Jewish traditions that do believe this. It, eternal life wasn't mentioned. Not really. It wasn't really a thing or a concept. Delivery from persecution and enslavement? Absolutely. If you were part of the chosen ones, you were good to safely travel about in your nomadic land, you know, in theory. Still, from Gentiles to Jew, from Muslim to Hindu, scriptures, papyrus, pamphlets, dissertations, to apologetics. Folks are burned, cities bombed. <laughs> the sacrilegious beheaded. All in the name of God and God's people who have been crammed into a box of orthodoxy. If I do this, if I believe that, then I am saved. Pews are filled with folks stuck in stages one, two, and three, like planes on a tarmac with a destination heaven. And pastors are, this is where I started earlier, and pastors are counting on it, pitching that the only way to heaven and eternal life is, is via the pew. Scott Peck calls this stage formal institutional. Among the positive attributes of this stage is a sense of humility and a willingness to serve with and for others, and to work within a social structure for the wider benefit of community. That's not a bad thing. To live well within a community, one needs to carry a sense of compassionate communal understanding. No problem there. However, Peck observed that folks stuck in this stage rely solely upon an institutional structure for a sense of stability. Unfortunately, there often comes with that a lack of flexibility in one's thinking and an inability to work well with others outside of their chosen community. In time, if their form, format, and forum are threatened, then those stuck between stages one and three feel attacked and fearful, often responding with anger and hostility. Now I know we've never seen anything like that happen around these parts. But again, there is so much we can learn from the stage three and build upon with stages one and two. When I was a child, Paul wrote, I thought I spoke like a child. And you don't get mad at a child for being a child, do you? There isn't anything wrong with any of these stages. As I will continue to remind you, they are all, all necessary. But holistically healthy faith formation requires progress and a growing understanding that no one, no one can put God in a box of rules, rituals, and structures. Keeping congregates dependent on religious orthodoxy and praxis, it ensures people like me to have job security.
and for our physical sanctuaries to remain sturdy. When we confuse church with constitutions and creeds and buildings, we are forgetting that church, church is its people. This structure behind me is a gathering place for our faith family. It is our clubhouse. Communities need spaces to gather, spaces to, to minister and share life and great, great like casseroles and devil eggs, coffee, friendship, shelter. But this building behind me is no more holy than the ground on which we stand. What is holy? What is sacred is when we believe in a community of faith in the way that God has longed for creature and creation to live. From Old Testament to the New, Me to the New Testament, the message, the method remain the same. Love and worship God in spirit and in truth. As written in Hosea 6.6, 6, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. As 1 John 4 reminds us, to love is to know God. Love self as God loves us. And then love others as thyself. Love over orthodoxy. Love over religion. Blessings falling upon the unchosen. Outsiders welcomed at our altar? When one finds himself struggling with these questions, then they are at a pivotal point in their faith formation. Remain where you are. Remain in your familiar. Or pack your bags, pilgrims, because we're heading towards stage four, the wilderness, which we're going to talk about next week. So Donna, let's pray. Please join me in the prayers for the people. Your response at the end of each petition will be, hear our prayer following my pause and the cue of Lord. So I'll say Lord, and you say, We are glad and rejoice forever in you, O God. With joy, we draw deeply from your well of salvation and pray that even as we have sung, you may fulfill our story, the story of your love. Though the world has been gripped by trouble since early days and life has often been short and tormented, you have given us a vision of a day beyond the terrors, a day when the heavens and earth will be new again, a day when the sound of weeping will give way to delight, a time when all creation will live in peace and people will long enjoy the fruits of their labors. Help us to hold to that vision when the temples about us are falling and our world is shaken. Strengthen us for telling of your truth and for keeping to your path, that we may not weary in doing what is right, but through endurance may gain our souls, even as you desire for us to do. Lord, hear our prayer. As we pray for a new heaven and a new earth this day, we especially are aware of those among us and those beyond these doors who are in deep need of your peace, of your healing touch, of your just and bounteous kingdom. We pray those who dwell in places of strife, need, and want And we pray for those whose names we now lift in silence. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have been bereaved in this past week, especially Renee's family who grieved the passing of Wanda, and to the family of Chaplain Lynn Hyder, especially her orphan son Wayne. 
Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are navigating the world of unemployment, of employment and unemployment, those navigating the dangers of working, especially on the front lines of public service, from educators, first responders, social and medical workers. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us give thanks to the one to whom we pray, the one who brings both the snow and the sun, the one who heals this troubled world, the sick, and those who turn to our God in faith, the one who grants new life not only to us, but to creation itself. Lord, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray to you in the name of the one who came to show us the way, he who is our redeemer, our brother, and our friend. We pray to you as one family, even as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now John Nassinger will um, share some music with us. Good morning. So this song is called Somos el Barco, which you might notice is in Spanish. And the first half of the chorus is Spanish. The second half is the English translation. So you're not missing anything as long as you listen to the whole thing. Um, and I got here and uh, thought, oh, I don't remember who wrote this song. So I, I looked it up on my phone, and the writer is uh, older than I realized. His name is Lore Wyatt. Um, but when I got on my phone, I saw the Peter, Paul, and Mary version, which I didn't know existed. And I saw the Pete Seeger version, which I didn't know existed. And I saw the Raffi version, which I didn't know existed. And for any of you who don't know any, don't know these people, don't worry about it. But, um, yeah, well... Uh, I just I remember in work at my office like 20 years ago some discussion of Peter Paul and Mary came up and even then there was a very clear generational divide as to those who absolutely knew who Peter Paul and Mary were and those who had no idea who Peter Paul and Mary were and uh, it was pretty They're rabbits, aren't they? amusing yeah. <laughs> thank you so anyway this is a, a long introduction to Somos El Parco <laughs> stream sings it to the river, the river sings it to the sea, the sea sings it to the boat that carries you and me, Somos el barco, Somos el mar. Oh, 
So it's interesting uh, is when I'm talking about stage three um, faith, it, it, it get well. It, it almost got me beheaded about 15 years ago. Um, uh, talking to a congregation that was anchored in it, and, and for good reasons, right? Um, we we come together because community is what we are called to be, and we care for one another. Um, Sometimes I'm going to be at my low place and you're going to have to lift me up and I'm going to do the same thing for you. This is what Jesus taught us to do is to take care of one another, love one another, do it for the least of these. Sometimes I'm the least of these. Sometimes I'm the one that's imprisoned. And when we go out and we live this life based on this teaching, it's a beautiful thing. And in our traditions, we come to this table, the symbolic table of grace. For some who believe in coming to this every week, the symbols are, are more literal, they're more than symbols. But we still come around the same gift of grace that Christ called us to. Remember me. Remember what I taught you. Don't get confused by everything the world and other people who claim to know better than I. Don't don't let that happen. And if you need to be reminded, come to this every week. And every time you come to this table of grace, remember what I've taught you. Do you remember what you were taught about this? Does it still hold the same beautiful mystery and healing presence? Mystical or actual? Do you remember? Or have we forgotten have we let so many other things get in our way of coming to a table of grace? The same things that get in the way for me to offer you the grace that God calls me to offer you. How often have we gotten in the way of others who need this table as much as we do? So let's think about it. Because on the night that he was betrayed, I mean, he... If Jesus was an if thener, he would have said, you betrayed me, I'm out of here. Good luck. It's not what was said. On the night that he was betrayed, he took this bread and he broke it. And then he said, and it's all mine. You don't get any of it. <laughs> took it, broke it, passed it among his friends. He said, take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And, and right after that, if they hadn't gotten it the first time, he took the cup and said, folks, I'm, I'm giving my all for you. This is a symbol of the blood that I'm willing to shed for you. Take now this cup of saving grace. Well, we come now to the time in the service uh, where we would normally collect an offering, but because of this lovely COVID thing hanging around still, we um, just want to remind you that you can um, give, you, give on Giveify, and we also have a box for, um, for you to put in a physical offering if that is the way you choose to do so. Um, we're going to stand and sing as John leads us in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Please remain standing for the benediction and then a safe passing of the peace. And just reminding you that we were going to call our business meeting to order in about 10 minutes. As we leave this place, we know God will be with us wherever we go. At work or play, at home or on vacation, we know God will be with us wherever we go. Whether we're happy or sad, on our own or with our friends, we know God will be with us wherever we go. Because God goes with us, let us go with joy and peace, readily sharing both with our neighbor. Amen.